there's this idea about the relationship between the husband and the wife. That husband has all the rights in the world, and wife has only obligations and duties. In Islam, any relationship is always based on mutual rights and responsibilities. As much as in Islam give parents rights, as much as Islam put responsibilities upon the shoulders. As much as Islam told us about the rights of the rulers, have put responsibilities on the shoulders of the rulers. As much as Islam tells us about our children's rights, our children have responsibilities as well. And in every aspect it's like this. And one of them is the relationship between the husband and wife. You know, as much as the husband have rights, he have responsibilities. And as much as the wife has duties and responsibilities, she has rights as well. And the uh, rule of thumb when it comes to the rights and responsibilities uh, in between husband and wife, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ They, whatever you expect from them, they should expect the same from you. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu an took this verse to the extent that when he enters his house, he would fix his himself, put perfumes in his beard. The Sahaba told him, why would you do that? Usually people do that when they leave the house, not when they enter. He said, wouldn't I would like to see my wife when I walk into my house, dressed up and, and getting ready for me and smell good? Yes, I do. And she should expect the same from me. And that's a very general rule and one of the most important rules that define the relationship between the husband and wife. So many times we use religious texts just to justify our abuse, you know. Uh, so I will say for it, I will use a hadith. Sometimes you see the man will use a hadith where he said, "Yes, the Prophet ﷺ said if a man call his wife to bed and she didn't answer his call, angels will curse her the whole entire night." Yes, the Prophet ﷺ said that. But you know what? That also apply the other way around. If also she asked her husband to bed and she doesn't want to go to, to sleep with her and prevent her from her right, he have also commit a sin as well, like her. Because, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And even specifically in regard to this hadith, there is another guideline that we have to take in consideration. Whenever we talk about rights and duties and responsibilities, there is a general concept in Islam. It's called, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وَسَعَهَا I'm only asked and responsible for doing what I'm capable of. So if she is not capable to intimate for a psychological reason or a physical reason, that's a valid excuse to say no. And no, it means no. Another example. People use a text where they said, in Nabi Sallallahu said, Ayyum imra'atin, any woman asked for a divorce from her husband, lam taruh ra'ihat al-jannah. She will not smell the fragrance of jannah. Then this will be used to justify uh, uh, abuse, all kind of abuse, Mental abuse, uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse to the wife, all kind of abuse that is exist. And the woman has to live in this relationship under the pressure of her husband just because this hadith said, if she asks for divorce, she will not smell the fruit of the But this hadith has nothing to do with what it was used for to justify the abuse of the husband. This hadith al ulama rahimahullah said, is talking about a woman who will he will cheat and she just want to sleep with more than one man she will marry him divorce him so she can sleep with another man and so forth that's what the, this, the ulama said this hadith is about because we know in the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that a woman came to the Prophet and said Ya Rasulullah inni la kufra fil iman I'm worried that to do something from the attitude of the jahiliyyah the attitude of the kufr days while I'm a mu'mina which is I will not be good to my husband I will not be grateful and thankful to my husband what's wrong? The only thing, her husband is a good Muslim, a good, he's a companion. What can be more religiously better than that? But she said, Ya Rasulullah, I can look at his face. He's so unattractive. Very unattractive. I just can't look at him. I couldn't take that. Then the Nabi Sallallahu didn't give him, a, how come, shame on you, he's a man, you know, you should be this and that. No, he said, give him back his mouth, and that's it. We call, we call the marriage off. As simple as that. There is nobody can force anyone into the into relationship. When the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi married a woman and he walked into the room and she saw the Prophet, she said, A'udhu Billah. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, she said, A'udhu Billah, I seek refuge with Allah. He said, you have asked a great one to protect you, so you are protected, leave. He, he, no, he didn't force her to marriage. You don't want to, that's Rasulullah, you don't want to be married to me, let's go home. 
And we never heard later on in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ talking bad about this woman. How come did she do that? Either one of the two women, khalas, they move on in their life. If she doesn't want to live with the man, she says nobody can force her to live with him. The problem sometimes when we use these texts to justify our abuse or misbehavior or to make us feel good about ourselves. You know, I was once in, in one of the conferences and uh, there a panel and the one the MC was a sister and she didn't manage the time properly so the last speaker took you know maybe five minutes or something like that it wasn't fair but he was so angry at her and so angry that he didn't get a chance to say you know what he wants to say when he prepared for it. supposed to be speaking 20 minutes and now he ended up with six seven minutes only then he started his talk with said he said, no people will achieve success if they are matter handled by women. You think that this person used the hadith because he believed in the hadith? No, he used the hadith because he wanted a personal revenge. Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he said, one of the worst people in this world is the one who write the deen for the dunya. We should write the dunya to reach the deen to the akhirah. Not to use the religion for personal gain. That's absolutely uh, 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 unacceptable. Every question ever asked about women's fiqh is answered in this online course. But if you want to challenge that, you have live Q&A sessions to ask what hasn't already been asked. Click on the button and get access to your student portal before that window closes.